This is the podcast for 2019, episode two. Uh, Before I get started, I want to thank everyone for their feedback from episode number one. And one of the things that I saw was great criticism. I've never done a podcast before, but the criticism was, hey, stop with all the pictures. It's a podcast. Just talk. (laughs) So I didn't know how to do that. So it's my first one. So um, I will do it like a podcast. I do appreciate it because like you said, we can move it along a lot faster. Um, Before I begin, uh, one thing that I didn't say on the last podcast and the reason why I'm doing this Uh, The United States government has deemed that I am a threat to national security. Uh, The knowledge of the forever time, contact 2014, contact um, IV, all all of these function as a threat to U.S. national interests. The problem with these films is they're all over the world now. And actually, the films are bigger overseas than they are in the United States. So... I have a lot of problems now being able to do things in the United States. Uh, When you are deemed a threat to U.S. national security, it means that you are considered an enemy of the state. And when you are an enemy of the state, uh, no government agency or function may assist you in any way. You no longer have any civil rights as a person. The Constitution that guarantees you the rights to liberty and the pursuit of happiness no longer apply to you because you are considered an enemy of the state. And because you are an enemy of the state, any and everything that is available to every U.S. citizen in the United States is no longer available to you. So they have the ability to come in and take anything from me without a warrant. Uh, They can do anything to me without any due process. Uh, There's no one I can turn to for help. I can't call, if I call, let's say the sheriff to come out and investigate, he'll, he'll say, who are you? I'll say who I am. He'll then properly say, I'm sorry, I can't help you and hang up on me. If I go to the local police department, they'll say, who are you? I'll say who I am. They'll get a phone call and they'll won't help me. If I go to the CIA, the FBI, they'll do the same thing. Nobody helps me. So because my civil rights are just, you know, just taken away from me, I go find a lawyer. The lawyer hears about my case to where, you know, they completely monitor everything I do. So for example, if you're on YouTube and you've ever written me a letter or a note and I never responded, it's because they delete everything that anyone sends to me so that I can't respond to you. So if you've ever sent me a note or anything or even posted a comment and I'm trying to comment back to you, They will delete everything that you say to me. For example, I used to do lots of interviews with radio and television, and they eliminated all that. They have complete control of everything that I do. So any website, any um, email, telephones, computers, anything that requires electricity, they have complete control over it. So sometimes I would go to my YouTube page and I would look on there and it would be like, hey, you know, I'd really like to do an interview with you. Can you can we set up an interview? So I would go to be able to write that person back. And before I could click their email, it disappears. I go to the spam folder before I try to, ref, you know, to pull it back up, disappears again. So they stopped me from communicating with anyone in the outside world. And I used to get lots of interviews from Los Angeles, New York, all around the country. Interview requests, interview requests, interview requests. So before I can even like it'll show up in my email interview request KABC Los Angeles. So before I can even click the email, it's deleted. If I go to spam folder, try to retrieve it before I can get it, delete it again. So they the contacts in my phone, for example, I used to do lots of interviews with coast to coast with Jimmy Church. If I try to contact Jimmy Church on my phone before I can call him, the contacts in my phone are deleted. So any contact in my phone that is associated with any kind, any type of media or contact with the outside world is deleted so that I can't pull it back up. So because they monitor everything that I do, it is the purpose is to silence and contain me and to stop me from speaking to anyone in the world. So that's the reason we're doing the podcast because and this is just an all seriousness. Uh, after I created Contact 2014, uh, Knowledge of Forever Time, number one, two, and three, uh, I used to work for the government. 
So one thing that you have to do, I travel all around the world. So when you travel all around the world, you have to be what's called deployable. And in order to be deployable, you have to be in tip top shape, no major illnesses, no anything that can stop you from doing your job. So I was always in perfect shape, you know, always took care of myself, ate right, that kind of thing. But after I created the knowledge of the forever time, the first three episodes, suddenly I go into my doctor's office and he says, you got two different types of cancer and they just out of nowhere. I don't know how you got this, but you have two different types of cancer and you're going to be pretty bad in about a year. So you have to check back with me because you'll be full blown by then. And I was like, well, how did I get cancer? He said, I have no idea because you also have two different types of viruses in your stomach and we don't know what they are. We can't identify them. So I said, okay. So he said, check back in a year. You should be full blown cancer. And you know, we, we can go from there. So I said, okay. Um, a year later, I go back to the doctor and I say, Hey, you know, you, you checked me out. You said to come back. And, and he looked at me and says, you're who? I said, I'm Damon. He said, okay, I can't help you. What? I, I can't help you. What do you mean? Can you, you, you can't, I just can't help you anymore. I'm sorry. I can't help you. And he shuts the door on me. So I leave his doctor's office and I notice there's government cars all around the doctor's office. So I found another doctor and I go to his office. And before I get to the front door, I notice there's government cars all around his office. So I go in there. I have an appointment to see a doctor that will give me a checkup to see how bad the cancer has progressed. And when I go in there, first thing they say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. What, what do you mean? You can't, we can't help you. So I try one more place, one more doctor. They said, hey, I don't, we're a doctor's office. We agree to help anyone who needs help. And they set up an appointment with me. I come in there to see them. Before I get there, there's 10 cars surrounding the building. I go inside. I'm sorry, we can't help you. You, you can't. Sorry, we cannot help you. So when you are deemed an enemy of the state, nothing that you do, no services can be provided to you by anyone in the United States. So when you're considered an enemy of the country, you are no longer a citizen. Nobody has to serve you at all. So when this happens to you, they follow you 24 hours a day. They monitor you 24 hours a day. And it's not just that. They, they try to make sure that you know that you're not liked in this country. So when someone when the United States is monitoring you and, and letting you know that you're no longer wanted in this country, the first thing you want to do is leave. So I want to leave the country. I go get my passport. They took it. They take your passport so you can't leave. So now you're stuck in the country and the first thing they want to do is let you know how they hate you now. And the one thing you have to know about when a government is against you, it's not like a private industry, it's not like a private organization. When the government is with you, it, money is no object. And when money is no object, they can destroy you and humiliate you in ways you can't imagine. They can literally come in your house when they want to because everything in the United States, the government has authority over. So if you have a security system, they call it a security system. They get your codes. They come in. <laughs> if anything that you have on, they, they literally turn the lights off in different rooms. If I'm on the computer and I'm doing something that they don't like, they will literally shut down the socket to the computer that I'm, which will shut off the computer. So that's what you deal with. And when they really want to, you know, mess you up, for example, if you go to the grocery store and there's a parking space close to you where you normally can go in really quick, they'll send 10 cars and they'll take up every parking space that's close to the store so that you have to park way in the back. And the reason they do that is once you go in the store, they go inside your car and they start either taking things, moving things or leaving spit on your steering wheel, things like that. It's just things. That's how they do it. They irritate you constantly. So, for example, I used to go to the movies a lot. I used to love going to movies. I go into the movies. I order a bag of popcorn, get me a soda. I go sit down in the movies. Watching the movie, I start eating the popcorn. And probably about, you know, a minute into eating it, I taste something that tastes really funny. Some, it's happened to me twice. 
And I'm like, what is that taste? Sometimes it's like a real salty taste. Other times it's a real sweet taste. But it was like really weird. So I get up out of the theater. I go outside, look inside the popcorn. It's spit. They pay, they pay people like unbelievable amount of money. For example, if a guy works at the um, movie theater, they'll pay him 500 to to $1,000. Spit in his popcorn and give it to him. And the guy will do it. So this happened at the movie theater twice. So if you go to McDonald's and you order, let's say, a quarter pounder and fries and a Coke, you get it and you drive off, you open up the box, the quarter pounder has had two bites already been taken out of it. So then, you know, you freak out, you go in there, you yell and scream, and everybody at McDonald's kind of laughs because they're all in on it. Because when the government is doing this to you, money is no object. They'll give everybody in the store $500 to mess with you. So it's, 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 it's constant and it doesn't stop. So every time when I go, go inside, you know, you have to do, you lock your car and you know, you hear the horn beep, you know, your car is secure. You, you sit inside the house, 20 minutes later, you'll hear your horn beeping again and again and again, because the government has the ability to get anything you have. So they make a copy of your key fob. So they'll start your car when you're not there. They'll move your car when you're not there. They'll turn your car on, turn your car off. I mean, it's just, it's constant. It doesn't stop. So the whole purpose is to irritate you. And the other thing they do is, is just crazy. They talk to everybody you know to destroy your name and your reputation. That's the whole goal, to destroy you because you've done something to the United States government that they don't like. So their goal is to destroy you completely. So they end up lying on you to your friends, your family. And the way they get you to talk to them is the most devastating way they do it of all. They literally come inside your home. And while you, and I'm not going to tell you how they get inside your home because if people understand how they do it, it'll be all over the country. But they have a way to get inside your home and it's so devastating. But when they get inside your home, they come in while you're asleep. They'll pull off your clothes while you're asleep take pictures of you while you're asleep naked and they'll share them to other people in your neighborhood saying this is what he does with some and they'll they'll lay somebody in bed with you so if you're a married man and they want to destroy your reputation they'll come in your house they'll strip you naked and have a woman lay on the bed with you it looks like both of you guys are sleeping together and they'll send the picture all around the neighborhood saying see you don't know this guy this guy is cheating on his wife and they'll start making up all these other stories So whichever story works, that's how they do it. And it's the whole purpose of destroying who you are, your reputation, so that you have no avenue to return to for friends, uh, for support, so that everybody you know will be turned against you. So that's how they do you when you're an enemy of the state. They just completely destroy you, destroy your reputation in every way. So that's the importance of getting out um, my side of the story because their side of the story is completely to destroy you. And they have a way of destroying you that it's, it's, it's government. Government has the ability to fire microwaves into your room, uh, uh, microwaves, microwave radiation. They also have a way to pour um, gas into your air vents, your air conditioner. So sometimes I would be sitting up, I'd be watching a game on TV and you know, I'd be eating dinner, watching TV in a game. Next thing I know, it's eight hours later. My dinner, wake up, my dinner's still there in front of me, and I don't know what happened. And sometimes I wake up, my pants are off. So they can do anything to you. So they basically completely destroy you and your entire life. So that's the sad part about doing things because when they want you gone or you're saying things they don't like, they can silence you like they're doing me. And when you're saying things that the government doesn't want you to say, they eliminate you. And the United States government isn't like Russia. It's not like North Korea. It's not like China. When, when you're expressing your views in one of these communist countries, they immediately show up with plutonium and you're dead. They just poison you outright. They'll walk up to you in a mall and do it. The United States is different. The United States is an open society, so they can't openly do things like that. So what they do is they give you naturally occurring diseases that are fatal. 
They'll put something in your drink, something in your food. And next thing you know, you have three different types of cancer out of nowhere. Or you'll have um, Ebola or you'll have liver failure or you'll have HIV. The United States gives you naturally occurring diseases that are fatal so that when you die, it looks natural. So that's what I'm up against. And that's what kind of life I have. So I don't know what it is that I've said in any of these movies that is causing the problem because they won't tell you. They just show up one day and just start destroying your life. So that's why these movies are so important. And that's why I'm trying to get them out. And uh, I don't know how much time I have because I'm not allowed to see a doctor. No doctor will see me. So I don't know how much time I have left alive. So I just want to say it while I can. Okay, now that's out the way. Um, The last time, the first episode, we're talking about, you know, when we left off is Revelation. Um, Revelation was a part of the story that I didn't know that the world didn't know. So that created a problem for me in my life, and I had no idea why. So this is right around 1993 going into 1994 and at the same time I'm going to this mountain the presence of God is coming down and I'm literally walking with God in a literal sense so during this time I'm becoming smarter I'm becoming stronger I'm becoming wiser and for some reason every time I open any holy word of God I understand it like perfectly and I don't I guess that's God's creation But the one thing I started understanding is when you're walking with this being that is God, the reason I walk with him every day that I didn't know until later, he's reshaping your brain. He's reshaping your mind. He's changing the way you think, changing the way you rationalize. And he's literally recreating you in a different way. And you don't know it until later. So um, every time I would open up the word of God, I would start reading it. And I'd sit in a chair. Twelve angels would come in on my left and sit down in like in a row. And then twelve angels would come in on my right and they sit down. And as I read, they would just sit there and just listen to me. And they did this, you know, all the time. And I, I never understood the importance of it or why. But then I came to the book of Revelation. And when I opened it, I had never seen a book that was so unique revelation was unique and when i opened it it's i didn't know anybody had opened it that's first of all i thought everybody i didn't know anything about religion so i didn't know what i had done so i'm opening up the book of revelation and it has all these apocalyptic imagery and things that people just don't understand so a lot of people today believe you know they know the story of revelation no you don't there's no human being on earth that knows what it means because everything that you've ever heard on any TV broadcast, read in any book, none of it is true. None of it. It's completely way off base. So when you understand what it means, which I did for some reason, I just, I understand it perfectly the first time you make people jealous, not in this world, the next world, they get very, very jealous of you. And I didn't know that because I didn't know anything about religion. So in the last podcast, we were talking about how the angels started turning against me, started, you know, treating me in a certain way and showing, displaying jealousy. I didn't know it was because everything in the Bible, for some reason, I could understand it perfectly. And when I was done with it, there's, you know how you read the Bible and you say, hey, you know, if Adam and Eve had these sons, they're the only ones on the world, where did all these other people come from? I mean, I just, I understood every question ever asked in the Bible because it it all made sense to me. So when I got to Revelation and I opened it, it was a big deal, but I didn't know it. So when I opened it, I didn't know I was opening anything that was special. But when you read the story, you'll get it. Because the story of the Revelation is basically the, the writer John is writing a story about what he's seeing in a vision in the future. And he sees Jesus. Jesus isn't the Jesus that we remember. Jesus died at 33 years old. But when he sees him, Jesus's hair is 
white. His eyes are gone out of his head. It's just burning fire in his eyes. And, you know, his feet are all burned up and stuff. So Jesus is talking to him. And the writer John doesn't understand why Jesus is looking this way. And then later, after he's done talking with Jesus, a door opens in heaven. So then he goes up to heaven. So when he goes up to heaven, he finds that there's an angel saying, you know, who can loose the seals? Who is worthy to open this book? So the book, the revelation is in God's hands. God's holding this book. And it says the book is sealed with seven seals, which means seals means it's closed. So in the ancient world, when you wanted to seal the contents of a letter where nobody else could read it, you would put a seal on the letter. And once you put the seal on the letter, it couldn't be opened except by the recipient. So a seal is indicative, letting you know its contents are closed. It's only open for the person that is supposed to receive it. That's what a seal means. So, you know, a seal could be your name, your crest or your initials, whatever it was. So God is holding this scroll and it says it's sealed with seven seals. And it says you can see writing on the inside and the outside, but it's sealed. Sealed means it's closed. It's locked. You can't open it. That's what it means. So God's holding it because God can't open it. He doesn't know what it means. So the word is sent to the angels to find someone who can open this book. So the angel starts, you know, screaming, you know, looking for is somebody worthy to open this book? And it says there's nobody found in heaven, nobody on earth, nobody beneath the earth. No one can open the book. So that's what the story starts off. And that's what causes the problem. So in the first episode, I told you about how I first came to know that God was real. And the first time that I came to know that God was real was, you know, talking to my cousin. He prays for me, but something weird happened. Um, he, we're praying to Jesus to come into my life, but something different happened. Some angels came and, you know, took my soul out of my body. So I end up walking around as dead person. And when you're walking around in the afterlife, which you're, you're living and you're dead, it's, it's a very different experience than anyone can imagine. But if you keep your head and you don't be, you don't freak out, you don't scream, you don't yell and you don't, oh, somebody save me, save me. If you just learn, it's probably the greatest experience you could ever have because you really learn what life is in a way that no human will ever learn it. So when you're walking in the afterlife, you learn something when you're dead. And that is they can touch you. That's the problem. When you have a soul in your body and you have a living life force and the dead come up to touch you, they can't touch you because your life force prevents them from being able to touch you because they're two different objects. So they can't, they can't touch you. They can swing at you. They can throw things at you, but you can't feel it because it's in a different dimension. But if your soul should be taken from you, that life force is gone. So when that life force is gone, they can now touch you. You can hear them. You can see them. You're basically in their world. And that is what created the problem for me. So when I read the revelation and I opened the revelation, that's when my whole life went right down the tubes because there's a passage in the Bible where, where it says, you know, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And I went, oh, I know exactly who, I know who that is. So I just started numbering this man, number and number, number. And I came up to 667, not 666. So when I numbered 667, all the 12 angels on my right, all the 12 angels on my left, they stood up in a panic. And they like, you could hear them just freaking out just yelling and screaming. And then suddenly they all left. And I, I didn't know why they just, they just left. And I don't know what I had done, but I, I balled up the paper that I numbered the beast on threw it in the trash. And I just kept reading. Cause I didn't, I didn't know what the big deal was. So while I was reading all of a sudden, I just feel this hot 
molten magma. It felt like it just hit me in the head. It started burning my head. And I was like, what is that? And I'm trying to wipe it off, but it's burning. So another person who is dead comes up to me and he stabs me and I could feel it. And I could feel pain. And I, I didn't understand why. And then all of a sudden I hear a, a bang against the door. I open the door. I go outside like, what the heck is going on? I look at the sky and all of a sudden this plasma looking bluish thing hits me in the face, but it's like hot, like fire and it's burning. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? I'm trying to wipe it off, but it's still burning. And all of a sudden these dead people come up. One of them hits me across the jaw. Another one hits me in the stomach. And I'm like, what is this? So I take off running. Next thing I know, there's like all kind of dead people just hunting me down. And the one thing you'll learn when you don't have your soul in there with you, the dead can touch you and you can feel it. So they started just doing just all kind of evil things to me just constantly every day. And nobody would tell me why. So this went on for probably six years. And during this process, I see Allah, I see Yahweh, I see all of the gods that people worship and they're all united against me for some reason. And I, I don't know what it is. So, they're doing all this evil stuff to me and I don't know why. And for the first six years, all I hear is see the Lord, you know, what we call Yahweh or Jesus. And he's just, he's hitting me. He's kicking me. And when I see him, he's just hitting and hitting and hitting. I can see sweat pouring down off his face. And I'm like, what did I do? Nobody will tell me. Nobody tells me what I did wrong. So for the first first three years, it was just Jesus and Yahweh. And they would do things like I would go to the movie theater. I would order some popcorn and I would eat the popcorn. I would feel hair inside the popcorn. I was like, what is this? What? what who put hair in my... And I would stand next to me. There would be some dead person who was literally cutting their pubic hairs off and throwing it in the popcorn. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what kind of life I was living. So the one thing when, you, when you're going through this living in the dead, their lifestyle, they can do anything they want to you. So if my mother or if I went out with a girl and we ordered dinner, you know, they would spit in the food, you know, they would put weevils in the drinks. It was all that kind of stuff. So I was always sick all the time because this it takes a toll on you because even though it's in the afterlife, it still affects you in this life if you don't have a full and complete spirit. So this went on for four or five years and the worst thing about it, and I know it's going to sound weird, but they kept grabbing on my penis all the time. And they have this, this, this thing in the afterlife where it's, it's, it's powerful. They can touch you in the head and you get an aneurysm. This is how they, this is what they do to the living and we don't know it. If they touch you in your forehead, you get an aneurysm and you die. If they touch you in the center of your chest, you get a heart attack and you die. If they touch you in your eyes, you get a cataract or you go blind. They have the ability to destroy us whenever they want. So they kept doing all these things to me. And for some reason, it didn't really have an effect. And I don't know why, but they would do all these things to me to kill me and to make me blind and all that kind of stuff, but it didn't work. So every day I would see the Lord just spitting on me, kicking on me and just, you know, doing horrible things. And if you, if you think this too unbelievable, it's really true. Every word I'm telling you is true. There's no embellishment of any kind. I could lay on my bed and I'd be asleep. And while sleeping, all of a sudden, I feel like somebody just punched me in the face really hard. I wake up out of my sleep. Blood is spurting out of my nose. And I run inside, you know, the bathroom and wipe it off. And while I'm looking at myself in the mirror, you know, wiping the blood, somebody will come behind me with an iron pole, 
hit me in the center of my back. And to this day, I can't walk like I used to because of that experience. So they have the ability, ability to, to hurt you. And the thing I don't understand is why was I singled out to be treated this way? I don't, I, I didn't get it. So after they did this, you know, I would go to the hospital. They would be like, Hey, you know, you're not going to be able to walk like you used to ever again. Or, Hey, I don't know who's, who's hitting you, but they're, they're really, you might you look like your nose might be broken. So it, it's a real experience. Uh, I got doctor's reports to go with it. And I just couldn't figure out. Nobody would tell me why every day. I'm like, why, what did I do? What did I do? No one would tell me. So, all of a sudden I would see the Lord. He would still be either kicking me or spit, spitting on me and just punching me and punching me and punching me and punching me. And after about four years, I kind of realized things ain't going according to plan because I could see the Lord. He's wearing white. He's punching and kicking and spitting and doing all these things to me. And I could see him punching me and he's just sweat just pouring off of his face. And he, he just stopped and he wiped his hair off his eyes and he was breathing real heavy. And he said, Satan, help us. And then that freaked me the hell out. Cause then these dark little beings just came out of like the walls, the woodwork, the floor, and they just start doing double time work, just really, really horrible, horrible work. And I'm not really taking sides, but when the forces of darkness start really doing stuff to you, it's a lot worse, a lot worse. This, this dark side comes in and they start doing only homosexual stuff. That's it, 24 um, seven, they start you know, sticking things in your anus, feeling on your, your penis. And they put this thing inside of you to where all you do is see, you know, homosexual males together, copulating 24 hours a day. If you close your eyes, you can see it really clear. If you open your eyes, it's above your vision. If you turn it left or right, it just won't go away. And they also have this way of burning you. So when they burn you, they put something in your mouth while you sleep and you wake up and words burn you. So for example, if you're walking and somebody says, boy, it's a hot day, it's hotter than hell out here. When they say hotter than hell out here, it's amplified inside your body and there's a burning that comes with it. So any human voice that speaks burns you. So if anybody, I went to a bank one time and I was cashing a check and I was just trying to make conversation. And I said, Hey, how's everything going? She said, Oh, it's really busy in here. I said, well, I said, well, I hope you get some rest. She said, well, you know, no rest for the wicked. That's the way it sounds to you. But she normally said it in a normal voice and it just starts burning you inside. So it's like a, a constant burning, burning and burning and burning. And it's just, this went on for probably four more years. So right now we're starting at 1993 and right now we're up to 1998, 99, and it's still going on and nobody will tell me why. No, not one person will tell me why this is happening. So after one after another, one after another, it's just burning and burning and beating and beating. And before when darkness comes, you can literally see hell. It's, it's surrounds you. And all you see is hundreds of, millions of people and they're all red and it's all burning but they're like alive and they're laughing because they're watching what they're doing to me and it's funny to everybody so they're doing all this stuff and this evil and stuff and then i don't know what what you call satan i, I don't know what you call him but i don't know what he did to me because everybody in hell was laughing and they laugh every day and then he did something and everybody in hell went <gasps> Like they were just in fright and I don't know what it was, but I cried like a baby. Cause I'm like, if, if it freaks everybody in hell out, then it has to be really, really bad. So this just went on year after year after year. And the whole focus for some reason was to turn me into a homosexual. And I don't know why that was important, but that's what they wanted to do. And after about five or six years, 
I saw Satan and his army still beaten and doing all these things for me. But after a while, it didn't hurt anymore. I didn't feel it anymore. I didn't feel any pain at all. And I could see them, him trying harder and harder and harder and harder to hurt me. And then I looked at him and I could see him punching and I can see him kicking. I could see him spitting. I could literally see him urinating in my face while I'm sleeping. He's doing everything to me. And after a while, he's, he's, he wipes sweat off of his face. He stops punching. He looks up and he says, this ain't a man. This is not a man. That freaked me out too. And after that, everything stopped. This is right around 2002. And I, di I didn't know what, what was happening. So after this, you know, the big guy comes in, you know, Lord God Almighty comes down. And when Lord God Almighty comes down, he's not nice, but he's big. He's really wide. He looks like a football player inside of a white robe. I used to tell him he looks like he had a moo -boo, a moo, moo on, but he's, he's really wide and he's really big. So he looks just like the picture of um, Sistine Chapel, just like him, only he's a little heavy set. So he comes down and he starts beating and hurting me and all that kind of stuff. But after a while, I don't feel it. For some reason, I don't feel the pain anymore. I can literally see them, but I, I can't feel anything. So while this is going on, there's a, a, a movie that comes out called Goodwill Hunting. And Matt Damon is in the movie. So I watched it on video. And before I watched it, these dead people came in and said, that's you. I said, who? Him. Matt, who is he? His name is Matt Damon. He's you. I said, why is he me? He said, I want you to watch all of his films for the next five to six years. Every film will tell you who you are. And I didn't get it. I didn't get it, but I watched Goodwill Hunting and the guy was, it plays a genius. He plays a genius in Goodwill Hunting who just misguided. So when the movie's over, I'm saying, I'm not a genius at anything. So how can that be me? I don't understand how that's me. He's a genius. I'm not good at anything. I don't know how to do anything. So I'm just a regular guy. So they kept saying, it's you. Watch every film that he makes for the next five, six, seven years. So I watched every film that he made, and I still didn't get it. So after I watched Goodwill Hunting, he came out with another movie and another movie and another movie and another movie, and I didn't understand the importance of the movie. I wouldn't understand the importance of his movies until probably 10 years later. But during this time, no one tells me why this is happening to me. So... Uh, right around 2009, um, I'm working for the government. I take a trip over to Egypt. When I go to Egypt, it's, it's, it, it changed everything for me. Completely, it just changed everything. Egypt, was, Egypt is, is the greatest place in the history of the world. There's no place in the world greater than Egypt, ever. So I get to Egypt. I'm walking in Egypt, and now I'm working for the government, so... I've got to make sure that I'm not seeing anything or hearing anything. So I'm taking this medicine that dulls your brain so that you don't see anything or hear anything. So it's working for me great while I'm in the United States. When I get to Egypt, I get on the ground. I'm on the Red Sea, just where, you know, in the Bible says where Moses part of the ocean. I can see Israel from the shore. So it's like really a great experience. So as soon as I walk onto the Red Sea, I, I get you know, set up in my room. I walk out on the sea just to overlook things. And then I hear a voice that is different from all the other voices. And it says, open your eyes. And suddenly I can see everything again. Even with the medicine, I can see every dead person. I can see every you know, angel, I could see everything in the sky, everything just opened up all over again for me. And I didn't know how that was possible because I started taking double doses of my medicine, but I could still see everything and I could hear everything and I didn't understand why. And I, I learned something though. There's a hierarchy between gods. There's a hierarchy. 
So lords are a lower level. Lord God is a higher level. And God is the highest level. It's a hierarchy in heaven. And I didn't know that. So when the God of Egypt shows up, everything changes. Because while I'm here, Allah, Yahweh, and Jesus, Lord God Almighty, they're the ones that's always beating me up and treating me bad. But when I went to Egypt, they completely didn't touch me. They didn't come near me. <laughs> they stayed away from me. It was, <laughs> it was, it was like there was a, a greater presence there that said, don't touch him. And they wouldn't come near me ever. So while I'm in Egypt, everything changes. I start seeing things and I start seeing that there's a difference in the way I'm treated over in Egypt than when I'm in the United States. And then I learned that a God's rule is territorial. It's based on where they live. So one day um, I'm, in, I'm in Egypt, I go to sleep. I'm laying down sleeping and when I'm sleeping, I hear a woman talking to me and she says she is the God of Egypt and she says she called me here. I want to show you something. And I started seeing a vision of the pyramids and I started seeing the pyramids. I started seeing the Sphinx. I started seeing all these things. And then I woke up and I said, I'm going to go there. But, you know, working on a military base and in Egypt, because there's a lot of terrorism, they don't allow you to go anywhere by yourself because it's against the policy. But I snuck off base by myself. I chartered a flight, flew to an entirely other city, flew into Cairo, and I went to see the, the pyramids. And when I went to see the pyramids, it was it was it was it, it changed everything. But before I went, this is the part of the story that really just hurt me. So I'm laying in the bed and I'm, she's showing me the pyramids. And then the vision that I saw was she showed me showing the pyramids. I was looking at the pyramids and then she showed me, you know, the Sphinx and all these things. And then while I'm looking, I could just see people coming from all over the world to see the pyramids and the Sphinx. And then I saw her sitting in front of the Sphinx and she was a giant. She's not like a giant, like we call a giant, like six, seven feet. She was like 50 to 100 feet high. She was like huge. So she's sitting in a chair watching everybody admire her. So she represents Egypt. So she's basically being looked at. So I saw a sea of people just looking at her. And then suddenly she gets up off her throne, which was made of stone. And she looked like a stone monument. And she just started crying just really sobbing loudly, just, just really just sobbing and sobbing. And she walked off the stage and I, I woke up. And when I woke up, I could still hear her crying. Even while I'm awake, I could hear her still crying. And I said, what, what does this mean? What does it mean? So I chartered a flight. I flew out to Cairo. And when I get out to Cairo, um, I want to go see the pyramids. So the first thing I do is I charter one of those tours where you go see the pyramids. So a tour company, the guy gets me in the car. Hey, how are you, my friend? I said, good. I want to see the pyramids. I take you to see the pyramids. I give you a good deal too. come with me. I take you to, I take you to see the pyramids. I said, great. So we get in the car and he starts driving and he's going to, he's talking about the great, how great it's going to be. So when he starts driving, he says, Oh, hang on a minute. I have to go somewhere and make one stop. So he goes to the stop and he picks up some guy on a corner. A big guy gets inside the car. Their two take off and they start speaking in Arabic. Now, I know a little Arabic, but mine wasn't that good when they talk fast. So they start speaking to each other in Arabic. Then each of them starts looking back at me in the rearview mirror. And I'm going, what are they talking about? So while they start driving, one of them says, hey, we have to make one more stop. We'll be right back. So they, then they drive off on this other road. We go down this dirty city road and it's a, it's a dead end street. We go to an apartment building where there's tons of apartments, but none of the apartments have actual windows in them. It's just apartment buildings with holes in the walls, no windows in any of them. And they get out of the car and I'm, they left me in the car. Next thing I know, three other guys come out. They're all speaking together and I don't know what they're talking about. I'm sitting in the car by myself. So 
all of them come over to the car and say, hey, are you ready to pay us a lot of money for this trip? I said, sir, you said it was going to cost me $150. Well, now it costs you $300. You have more money, yes? I said, no, you, you said it's going to cost me $150. It's $300 now. But you can get more money, right? You have credit card, right? I said, um, yeah, I have credit card. He says, good. We charge $300 and we charge $200 more later. You okay with that? It's $500, right? I said, hey, you, how do we go from $150 to $500? Well, sir, you know, I take you, show you a good time, show you pyramids, $500. You can get more money, yes? How You have debit card too? How many credit cards? You have three credit cards or four? You're from America. You have lots of credit cards. We, we have good time, me and you. So then all the guys get in the car. It's me and all of them. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm getting robbed. I'm in Egypt. I'm getting robbed. So we're driving, driving, and I go, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. And they're like, what? What is it? What is it? I said, I left my bag at the airport. What bag? My bag with my wallet in it. Everything's at the airport. Your money is at the airport? I said, yes. Oh, we go, we go back there to get your money. So they all drive back to the airport. As soon as we get to the airport, I get out. I say, that's all right, dude. I don't need you to help me anymore. What are you talking about? I said, no, that, leave me alone. Leave me, I don't want to deal with you anymore. So then they got angry. And then they promised to do harm to me because I got out of their car, which they were trying to rob me. So I get out of their car, you know, they're kind of angry. They're hanging around, letting me know that if I leave with anybody else, they're going to hurt me, that kind of thing. So it didn't bother me. I found another tour company and they brought me a guy. He takes me out there. We see the pyramids. We get to the pyramids and it was unlike anything that I was expecting because it was, it was a hard trip. So we, we get out to the pyramids and he's trying to find a place to park. So the guy says, hey, come this way. I'll let you park this way. I'll let you park. And he says, I want to park here. And they say, well, who do you have in the car? He says, I just have an American in the car. They look inside the car and they say, mm, you can't park here now. No, thank you. You got to find somewhere else. So the driver has to go somewhere. And I said, driver, wh why won't he let us park? He said, my friend, you do not want to know. I said, why won't he let us park? It is because you're black. I said, oh, okay. All right. All right. Thanks, man. So we start driving, trying to find somewhere else. So we found somewhere else to park. We get out and I need a tour guide to give us a camel or something to ride on. So the guy, he takes us to the camel and the guy says, hey, come on in. I give you a good deal. Good deal. So he comes in. He says, okay, we need a good deal. We're going to take him to the pyramids to see everything. He says, okay, I take you to the pyramids, see everything. And you American? I said, yes. And he says, oh, American costs double. He says, why is double? He says, oh, you know, Americans have money, so we need money, so we can charge a double. And the driver says, no, don't do it, don't do it. I said, yeah, but he says, I can do it. He said, don't do it, don't do it. So we get back in the car, and I'm like, why shouldn't I do it? He says, he's charging you double, just you. I said, why? He says, because you're black. I said, oh, okay, awesome. So this has been a problem ever since I get to Egypt. So we're, we find another place. He finds another guide. He gets me on a camel, we're riding. He takes me to the Sphinx, which was amazing. So when I get to the Sphinx, I see the Sphinx and it, he's showing it to me. It's beautiful. And I wanted to touch it and see what the, the grain feels like, you know, just to see what the woodwork, I mean, the, the work feels like. So as soon as I touch it, boom, all power in my body just went away, just gone. And I'm falling to the ground. And right before I hit the ground, I kind of pull myself back up, you know, stumble and, you know, gather myself. Everybody looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? And I'm like, oh, my God, what is it? And so I'm thinking, you know, logical. It's hot outside. I probably had sunstroke. I hadn't had anything to eat. Maybe I just got, you know, a little lightheaded. So that's what I thought. So after we see that, you know, there's, there's, there's beggars around the whole thing. So you don't really get to enjoy it the Sphinx. Somebody's always going, give me money, give me money, give me money. And you say, here's some money. Then you try to really look at it. Hey, give me some money, give me some money, give me some money. And you say, okay, here's some money. So you can try to look at it. So you never really get peace because someone's always begging you for money. So you're trying to hurry away from the Sphinx. You don't really get to look at it like you want to because someone's always pestering you. So you go back to your guide. He says, okay, we take you over to the pyramids. He get off the, the camel right at the pyramid. It's amazing. If you ever see it in person, it's the most amazing sight you'll ever see. So when you go up to the pyramid, though, 
they don't take care of it at all. Because when you're going up to the pyramid in the sands, you see cigarette packages, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken boxes, Coke cans, bottles, cigarettes. It's just, it's, it's filthy all around the pyramid. It's just nasty. The whole thing is nasty. So you get off, you walk over to the pyramid, and I'm trying to really look at it and take it all in. But as soon as I get off, hey, sir, can you give me money, please? Give me money, give me money. So I give him some money. Okay, leave me alone. I'm trying to look at it. So I try to look at it again. Somebody will come, hey, give me money, give me money, please give me money. I said, okay, here's some money. Okay, can I look at it, please? So I try to really look at it and feel the stonework. Hey, give me money, please. Somebody get, so it won't stop. So after a while, I just said, come on, let's leave. I'm ready to go. So I get on the camel, we leave. I'm angry because I don't get to see it like I want to see it. Uh, it. The whole area is just completely filthy. So we leave and he says, what else do you want to do? I said, I want to have dinner on the Nile. So he says, I have a great restaurant for you. So he takes me out, takes me to a great restaurant. When I get to the great restaurant, the guy at the front door won't let me in. And I said, why won't he let me in? And the driver says, I said, don't tell me because I'm black. He said, I'm sorry, yes. I said, well, why can't I get in? He says, well, you know, you're black. And I said, oh, okay. So he says, oh, hang on, let me take this. Care. So he starts talking to the guy in Arabic. Next thing you know, come on in, come on in, no problem. So we get inside. I'm saying, what did you say to him? I told him you work for special forces of the Marines and you're helping us here. So he let you in. I was like, oh, okay, got it. So we're sitting there. We're having dinner on the Nile. Everything's great. The driver's good. I bought his, his dinner, bought his lunch and everything like that. So we go back out. He wants to go to the, Chi- I want to go to the Cairo Museum. Cairo Museum is not like what you think. They really have no great Egyptian antiquities in there at all. All of them are at the Louvre. So I was very disappointed in that. But when we left uh, the Cairo Museum, you know, we were getting charged extra for parking. And it's because they didn't want me to park there because I'm an American and I'm black. So it was like really bad the whole time. So after they started treating us really bad, I said, look, dude, just take me to the airport. He says, you still have eight hours left. I said, just take me to the airport. I had enough. So he takes me to the airport. I give him a really good tip. I walk inside the airport. It's going to be another eight hours before I get on my flight. When I get inside the airport, I just, I was just done with Egypt. I, I was, I was so angry. I just, I, I hated it. So I, I get inside the airport. I'm sitting down. And then I think, let me go get something to drink. I, I just want to get something to drink. I get up out of the seat and one of the security guards in Egypt, they all carry Kalashnikov rifles. So I asked the security guard, excuse me, uh, where can I get something to drink? And he says, upstairs, third floor. I said, thank you. And as I walk away, he grabs my, my shirt from behind me and pulls me back. And I said, what'd I do? He said, give me money. I said, what? Then he grabs his gun, puts his finger on the trigger and looks at me and says, I said, give me money. I was like, oh my God, I'm getting robbed by the police. You got to be kidding me. So I said, hang on. I tell you what, I'm going to go get something to drink and I'm going to give you some money when I come back. Is that okay? He says, okay. So I start walking. He walks behind me. I get on the elevator. He gets on the elevator with me. I go up there. I get something to drink. He's standing there in line waiting for me. So as soon as we come out, I get ready to pull the money out of pocket. He says, no, 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 no. Don't do it out here. Do it in the elevator. So we get inside the elevator. I give him equivalent to 50 of their dollars. Give me more. I said, you told me you needed money. I gave you $50 of your money. Give me more. And I thought about it. And then I said, no, I'm not going to give you no more. If you want to shoot me, go ahead and shoot me. I had enough of this place. That's it. So I got off the elevator. I walked back to my seat. I'm thinking I'm going to feel some bullet shells in my back. I didn't. I kept walking. I kept walking. And then when I knew I was safe, I walked and I thought about my experience in Egypt. And I said, this is the worst place I've ever been. I hate it here. And as soon as I said that, I could hear her crying. I could hear her crying really loud. She was crying and crying and crying. And after I heard her crying, and I remember what I had just said, then I realized why the queen of Egypt was crying. They've destroyed her country. It's, it's, it's destroyed. 
and it brings her great sadness. But the thing that I did learn that day, she gave me a gift because when I came back from Egypt, I know everything about anything that has ever been created in Egypt. I know every hieroglyphic. I know every story. I know every creation. I know what it does. I know everything about Egypt. So I have to give all thanks to the queen of Egypt because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't know anything. And the last gift that she gave me before I left, I was sleeping in my room. And I think it was two days before I was back, come, come back to the United States. And while I was sleeping, I heard voices. And I heard someone come in the room. It was like two or three people talking. And all I could hear was, that's him. Him? Yes, that's him. That's the one everyone's talking about? Yes. He's a great man. He doesn't even know it. I was like, that's really him? Yes. I thought he'd be older. No, no, that's him. And I'm listening to this, but I think I'm dreaming. And one of them says to the other, they're hating him and he doesn't know why. He doesn't know the reason they're hating him is because he opened the book and he opened it better than the version that God has. And I'm like, what? Wait, wait a minute. What? I wake up. What? What are you talking about? Who is that? Who said that? And all of a sudden, they just stop. And they walk out of the walls. Just They're like dead people. And they walk right through the walls. And I'm like, what? What are they talking about? What book did I open? What, what did I do? What, 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 who, how am I great? What, what did I do? <laughs> and I didn't understand what they were talking about. I wouldn't understand it until I got on a plane. The reason Yahweh, Allah, and all of them were hating me is because it was 2000, 2009, 2010 when I was over there. The reason they were hating me is because in 1993, I opened the Revelation. And no human being is supposed to be able to do that. And because I opened it, according to the word of God, it means that I'm king. It means that I get great authority and power. And I didn't know that. And that's why they were hating me to destroy me so that I wouldn't know that. It's all a true story too. So I started writing the story of the revelation. I started writing it in a book and it changed everything because I began to know who I am and I began to know why they were trying to stop me from doing anything. It, it's, it all made sense. And the best part of it is, you know, when, when you're attacked and your attacker beats you and beats you and beats you and it's horrible and it's horrible and it's horrible, Eventually you get stronger. Eventually the pain goes away. And then once you get to that point, now your attackers, your Lord, your gods, your Christ realize after that, we can't beat him anymore. We can't hurt him. There's nothing we can do now. That's the best part of the story. <laughs> so once, once we created the, once we understood, once I understood what my purpose was, why they hated me, and why everybody was so angry. And I started writing it, and believe it or not, when I wrote the story, it was unbelievable. It was, it was an unbelievable experience. But writing it is one thing. Telling the American public about it was the hard thing because I learned something about religion. Everybody's not like me. I wanted to know what God is because I wanted to know the truth. Everybody else on the earth, that's not the way they see religion. They don't want to know the truth. They just want something to believe in. And that was the hard lesson I had to learn. So after I opened the revelation, um, tried to talk to American public, they weren't receptive to it. I never touched it ever again. But the glory that it brought me made everyone jealous of me. And when I say jealous, the next year that I wrote it and I finished it, I was in a desert in the land of Allah. And Allah appeared. Yahweh appeared. The Lord God Almighty appeared 
what you call Satan appeared and what you call Jesus appeared all at the same time. And it was not a good day for me. 2011. All I can tell you is one by one, none of them can hurt me. None of them can defeat me. But when I saw them all together, they nearly broke my legs and broke my jaw.